Welcome, welcome, welcome to another wonderful episode of Fish North Georgia's The Live Well, brought to you tonight, and as always, by For Her Outdoor Apparel. If you need any apparel for the outdoors, for the lady in your life, or for yourself, check them out at ForHerOutdoor.com. Go there tomorrow, you might get hooked up with a $5 Friday. We got a great show for you tonight. We're going to talk a little jig fishing. They eat the jig. Ryan, do they eat the jig? At times. At times, they eat the jig. Absolutely. So we've got a, I have a star-studded panel for you guys tonight, and we're going to have some fun with this, and don't be shocked because I have a different look on, on me. I do not have glasses anymore, <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit different for you guys. It's probably going to be a little bit of shell shock for you, but tonight, we're going to talk all about jig fishing. I've had several, several requests. I need to talk about jig fishing. need to talk about jig fishing need 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 to talk about jig fishing and it is something that we hit on on a regular basis but we don't really get too in depth with it so tonight is the end all or be all we're going to talk jig fishing we got three jig fishermen here who are arguably really really good i'm the low man on the totem pole but i got one guy over here mr casey blanton is in the house alatuna fame he is here. He is in the house. He's ready to go. He is by far the best jig fisherman. We'll let him and Farmer, Jonathan Farmer over here to my right, hey, we'll man. let them to argue over who's the better jig fisherman. I am, you know, the low man on the totem pole. So we're going to have some fun with this, guys. Bust out your notepad, notepad. Get ready. I told these guys beforehand, we're not going to give away spots. But let's make these guys who are watching it, if you have any serious questions and you really want to catch fish on jigs, tonight is the night for you. Okay. Tonight. Tonight. Uh, uh, it is exactly what is going on tonight. So we've already got a few uh, guys coming in already. We want to remind you, Facebook users, so that way we know who you are. Head on over to www.streamyard backward slash Facebook. And that way, Red, just put your name in there. So that way, when you do pop comment and pop up, you know, with a comment, we actually know who you are because on our side, all it says is Facebook user. So we want to know exactly who you are. We want to put a name to the face if we can do that. So, um, so let's just go ahead and get started. Let's first of all, so before we does, do anything, does Buddha love a jig bite because it sounds like he his says last he name. does. He says he does. Like, that's how a good jig bite sounds, right? Yong. Yeah. It's, well, it, it does. It does ring the bell. I guess you could say you could ring. The, would y'all agree that you could ring the bell with a jig? It's def, it's definitely a ring the bell type of bait. So you know, uh, we uh, we're going to be doing this. Let's get the elephant out of the room though, real quick. St. Lawrence River, day one. Damn near 30 pounds, dude. <laughs> Saw this morning first thing whenever uh, I checked it, like Welcher was in first or second with 22 pounds, and I about come unglued, and I happened to check into, I don't know, maybe it was 1 o'clock, and I saw 25, 25 and a half, and he was way back there. I knew those boys were catching him. I, I, had, to, I had to break that out tonight because when I saw the weights, the St. Lawrence is just in, insane. It's absolutely insane fishing. I mean, 29.5, five, five fish, all small. <laughs> but that is a bucket list trip, if I do have to say so myself. I would definitely. You want to go, you want to go to St. Lawrence River? Let's, let's load up and go. Yeah. Let's go. We let's can go, go do that. So, all right. So, I had to get that out of the way. 29 pounds of brownies. Absolutely phenomenal. St. Lawrence River still pumping them out. There's a reason why it is one of the best bass lakes or river chains, however you want to say it, bass fisheries. Why is one of the best bass fisheries in the entire world? So I wanted to get that out of the way because I knew a comment was going to come uh, <laughs> along the way. So uh, so apparently I need a job. This is my job. This is my job. I actually get paid to do this. I enjoy it. So, you know, can't everybody live the dream like me, but jig fishing. And here he was saying that he was the low man on the totem pole. Hey, if only I could get paid to do this. In terms of in terms of jig fishing, I am the low man on the totem pole. <laughs> so, so let's bust right into it. Jig fishing. I, I could my start opinion. with start with setups. What's your setup? I, no, I'm gonna get I'm gonna give my opinion on it first before we get into setups because all three of us, I guarantee, all three of us have a different setup. Jig fishing. There is no better way when you need a big one 
that is that is by far hands down the best percentage to get a big bite and if you catch five on a jig you ain't got no nine pounds let's just put it to you like that i mean even on alatoona now it's gonna be getting up there higher because the fish are getting bigger on alatoona i'd love to get higher than nine pounds right now no, <laughs> <laughs> water temperature is nine degrees. Shoot, we nine pounds is hard to come by, my friend. He gets, <laughs> he gets right. He gets right. Remember, Facebook users, you guys. I don't, you know, I need to know who you are. So, we've got a lot, a lot of uh, Facebook users. So, um, for me though, jig fishing, absolutely, one hundred percent, is the best way, in my opinion, to get a quality bite, and not just a quality bite as in like well you know is potential big fish of the tournament quality bite and a, and a jig also to me is one of the most versatile baits that you could possibly use you can skip it swim it hop it punch it whatever flip it i don't care it don't matter um it 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 is you can imitate crawfish you can imitate brim you can imitate bait fish there's all different kinds of things that you can imitate with with a jig so uh that's my opinion on it. Farmer, what's your opinion on a jig? A uh, jig to me is just, I I have one tied on year round because I can go if I need that kicker fish. Mm -hmm. If I need, I know I can go flip lay downs, wood, something like that with a jig and put my fifth one in the boat or put a monster. Yeah. What about you, Casey? So what I was... I was going to speak on that right whenever you said it, because that's the main reason that I fish a jig is the main reason behind it is because winning takes nine out of 10. I'm not saying that you can't win with five of the same exact size fish, you know, say Alatoona right now, you come in with two or five, two and a half pounders, more than likely you've got a good chance at the check or uh, you're coming out of there in the top two, top three. So what it takes is that big bite to win. And what you just said and what he just said is the reason why I have four of them tied on my deck every tournament. What it takes is that big bite. I am way more confident after I've gotten that big bite. Man, I really feel confident now. Like I, I think I know a couple spots. I can go find a 12 to 14 inch fish, fill my limit, you know, or maybe two pounder to go with my big one something of course i would love to have all studs but that's rare whenever the water temperature is 90 degrees it's hard to come by so that's one of the main reasons why i stand behind the jig is because the jig bites the big bite i was just taught that by some people and i like the, the sound jig of that. bite is the big bite and my partner my monday night partner uh he will sit back there and he will drag a texas rig and a shaky head until the paint is scraped off of every single one of them or they are gotten hung up in some rocks or a brush pile. But the jig and every now and then that worm, they're they're way more focused on that. They just want the tails of mine. Mm -hmm. And then but when he throws that worm in there, I'm like, oh, I see how tonight's gonna go. But the ratio there, I have to go with the jig because the jig bite's gonna be the big bite nine times out of ten. <laughs> I think I could speak for all of us on this. I think I could say this. I think all three of us, I think we kind of uh, at times tend to force feed a jig. Would you all agree that? Yes, sir. I, force feed. I try and force feed them a jig. I don't know how many. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think when it comes to just, you know, it's like, you know, most of the time when you get bit on a jig, there's no like, I've got to measure it, you know? <laughs> Norm. It's definitely going in the box, or it's definitely going on the on the on the uh, digital scale to weigh in for sure. When we're talking lakes around here, these high highland reservoirs that we fish with a jig, normally your fish is two pounds or bigger. Spots, largemouth, it's two pounds or bigger with a full size jig. The finesse jigs might be a little different. You'll pull your smaller ones, but your full size jig around your brush piles, your rock piles, stuff like that, it's two plus. Mm -hmm. It's those tournament fish that mm -hmm. everybody looks for, those cookie cutter fish. Yes, yes. Even when I'm – the cookie cutters are the ones that I'll – like there's certain times of years, of course, you can throw a quarter ounce out there or a mini, you know, a very small jig. But those cookie cutters say I'm like – I'm tired of my 3H just getting picked up. Oh, there he is. I couldn't tell you how many times I've set the hook here lately to nothing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was like, 
and I knew if I was throwing a smaller jig or a smaller setup, if I was to downsize to from my 15 pound to 12 with a quarter ounce or one of those smaller little ball heads or the, mm -hmm. what are they? The strike King, uh, help the, me out right here, the bitsy, the bug. bitsy mm -hmm. bugs and those little guys there. I mean, for the money and as many times as you're going to lose them. I mean, it's hard to beat whenever they're just dialed in on that, but nine times out of 10, you want to be throwing that three eights, you know, a full size with a five fish, out hook, yeah. with a four haul, you know, mm -hmm. every now and four then. Four five out. Here we go. That uh, the <laughs> tungsten when it comes to those smaller ones, though, that's that's hard to beat on those ball head jigs and the fall with that. That's whenever you can really flirt with the three alt and the mm -hmm. four alt there. But I would much rather be like we're like you were saying, you know, in that big, five alt, big stick, four big line. Range. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it takes that that little bit of subtle action to really make them fire, kind of like a finesse bite yeah but. so we've already got a bunch of questions already and i promise you, you i've been glancing at the questions and i'm, I'm, I'm not even going to start pulling we're not even going to we're not even going to pull them up don't even have any reason to pull them up yet because i'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now we're going to get to every single one of these that i've already been glancing at so let's go ahead and knock it right out of the park right here from the start before you throw the jig you have to have a setup what kind of setups do we use I'm going to start with Casey. What is your main setup? And do you have a backup setup depending upon and think about it like this? Let's talk open water. Let's talk brush pile fishing, rock fishing, and let's talk heavy cover. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk Highland Reservoir, uh, rock points, rock humps and brush in that area code. Mm -hmm. Um, when I'm in these Highland Reservoirs that are around here, Alatoona, Lanier, you know, I, everything up north, Notley, Chateau, Blue mm -hmm. Ridge, all of that, I don't have the NRXs. I don't, mm -hmm. I have one NRX. It's in my crawl space. I don't even touch it. Yeah. I, what's the one that's the green one, Farmer? The GLX? Is yeah, that what it GLX. is? GLX. I have a GLX. I've had it for a little while. I also, the right GCX. when I started with the club I fished with, me and my partner, we happened to win a, uh, it's a mojo. It's six, eight. And I have a hyper mag on that one. And if I want to come through brush or I really want to feel everything, that's the rod that I pick up. And it's a medium heavy six, eight mojo. And uh, because I can step on it when I'm setting the hook on a fish and I'm stumbling because the waves are coming through or you're stepping backwards. And how many times have y'all broken eye, you know, trying to land one or set a hook on one mm -hmm. that thing is durable and but my glx whenever i grab a hold of it i'm 99.9 percent .9 i'm gonna get that fish to the boat mm -hmm. when i set the hook on that mojo the glx is medium heavy and it's it's a six nine and the other one's a six eight i'm a shorter guy when yeah. it comes to the boat i try to get up under there i can't do the seven seven one i wish i could yeah but just the confidence was it isn't there I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that about the length of the rod. We're and, going to get right into that here in a few minutes. But that so. GLX, it's just got that little bit more of a backbone mm -hmm. that when I stick them, and if I can stay with them, I got a BB1 Pro on that one. It, it uh, It's the one that's the wider one, not like the, the first BB1s. You know, it's yeah. just got – and that thing right there has been flawless for years. But in my Hyper Mag on my other one, it's hard to be keeping up with those fish and coming through that brush like that. Like trying instead of looking like a crawfish, I'm a brim mm -hmm. and I'm a brim popping through there. And if you want, if the four pounder wants to eat me, which I wish he would all the time, uh, I would love that. But I have more confidence when I have that GLX a little bit stiffer because when you grab medium heavies and different brands, I don't care what brand it is you buy, they're going to have that little bit different action to it. When I stick one with that GLX, it stays there. That other one's got a little bit more play to it, but when they're just wanting to nip at it, it's kind of the key rod. Mm -hmm. That GLX, I'm like, dang, they just bit my tails. Pick my other one up. They keep doing the tail biting thing, and I'm setting the hook to air. No, they'll have it, but you got to be sure to fight them the right way, and that's kind of to where that old Gerald Swindle slack line has to leave you mm -hmm. kind of got to give it that hard lean and just start to reel you know try to keep the rod tip down damn he's there because right now they're like uh anybody i don't know if anybody can say that they fished monday night uh last week but every fish that i hooked they all went to gymnastics class because they come out of the water doing backflips every single one of them and i talked to multiple people that said that they hooked into 10 7 
four fish before they put one into the boat doing the same thing. It blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Any other setups that you got? That, those are my main two. Those are your main two? Uh, of course, whenever it comes to Gunnersville, Chickamauga, in mm -hmm. the grass. We're well, that's be, why I asked because I know be, you go there. Yeah, we're going to be we're gonna be heavier, mm -hmm. you know, a lot heavier. Say you get into that half-ounce football, you're snapping it through the grass, you know, that type of stuff. Then I'll go with a 7.4 heavy, 7.6, you know, and grab a hold of something to where I can bone them and try to pop it through that grass. But nine times out of ten, if I'm throwing that, there's also going to be a chatterbait on the same – uh, medium heavy glx right and i'm going to be snapping it through there so there's kind of that fine line it depends on how they're biting if they're chomping you get the heavy out mm -hmm. let them have it yeah but if you're, having, if you're having a hard time with it when it comes to the jig you know you're having a hard time with it back it off a little bit yeah you'd be surprised pound mm -hmm. test line last thing before we move on to farmer quarter ounce uh, a lot of people think i'm crazy but i'll throw it on 12 but i make sure my drag's there and my retying is religious mm -hmm. how and, often do you retie uh with 12 pound you like buddy brett that fishes the club with me he he catches one boom i mean he don't have time he's immediately retying he is not losing a four pounder on the next cast just because he was lazy in his mind 12 pound test i'm retying every single time 15 I'll put you a limit the boat. And then mm -hmm. I look at it and I'm like, all right, you know, yeah. I get to fill in the line. I'm like, okay, <laughs> don't be lazy, you know, flip it off of there, retie, do your thing, or pick up another one. Cause I normally have, like I said, four of them tied on there. Farmer, what's your, what's your rod and reel set up? <clears throat> Depends on what I'm fishing. It, my, me and you fish a lot of similar. We sit fish similarly. Mm -hmm. I'm a shallow guy love to stay shallow so i'm fishing the heart of lay downs i'm fishing under docks most of the time i'm throwing a seven three heavy with 17 to 20 pound test to pretty much cross their eyes and bring them out yeah um now if i'm out offshore fishing brush piles i'll fish a seven six medium heavy um, so you definitely little, go for a longer rod because you're using even longer rods than I use. I well, we're right there at the same height, but you're still using a longer rod than me. Yeah, well, I use a seven three for skipping, seven three, seven four. Yeah, when I skip, but a seven six, I like a seven six when I'm offshore because it gives me that extra, that little extra when I pull back. And I'm sure everybody's noticed it when you pull back on it, you're in deep water, you're 25, 30 foot plus. When you pull back, sometimes that rod will end up back here before you actually get that line tied. Mm -hmm. So now I've got an extra couple inches. So when I reel down on that fish and set the hook, I'm still right here in position to fight that fish. I'm not back here trying to do this number to catch back up to it. Yeah. Yeah. Pound test line. I know um, you're heavy. <laughs> Beautiful day. Beautiful day. <laughs> he throws a broke stick. I do. Well rope. Yeah. So is it the pool cue when you got to finesse them, farmer? Yeah, it's a pool cue when I, when I have to finesse fish. But um, if I'm fishing a, um, a fishing offshore, fishing a finesse jig, it's 12 to 15 pound test. If I'm fishing a full size three eighths or a half ounce in cover where I'm close quarter combat, it's 17 20. Yep. Same here. Heavy, heavy, heavy. I like it. I like it. So for me, you know, I have two setups. That's just me. Um, we didn't talk about gear ratios, but we'll get into that. Um, Eight one to one or higher. For, <laughs> this, you know, we're, this is the reason why we made this table. <laughs> quarter, quarter in, seven. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. Seven, five My primary setup, whether I'm skipping docks, throwing in blowdowns, fishing brush, rocks, points, humps, don't matter, whatever it is. It is a seven foot one medium heavy extra fast rod. I have a, um, I do not skimp on the reel. Uh, I, I, I use a lot of hundred to $150 reels on a lot of my other setups, except for my jig setup. The only Shimano reel I own is on my jig rod. That is the only Shimano uh, reel that I own. And I know a lot of people like Shimano, but I'm an Abu guy at heart. And uh, I pretty much have mainly Abus and some Lou's. But my jig reel never changes for me. It's it's a Shimano. They have they have the best, they have the best drag. They have the best castability, smoothness, and they just they're built to hold up 
under the pressure of how hard, you know, at times I'll set the hook. And I think all three of us, I think all three of us sitting here at the table, I think we absolutely try to cross their damn eyes every time they bite. You know, there's nothing funner than crossing their eyes. Um, but that's my main setup. And then I have another setup for grass type lakes like Chickamauga um, on, on, over, on up that way um, around grass. And it's just a 7.6 heavy uh, extra fast rod. And uh, my gear ratio stays the same. It's 7.3 to 1. That's pretty much where I stay. Uh, I don't get up into eight one to one because you lose power with eight one to one, and uh, I like the seven three to one stay there. And I'll throw anywhere from twelve pound straight fluorocarbon all the way up to twenty pound fluorocarbon, and even braid if I get in the grass. So sixty five pound braid, nothing less. If you're throwing anything less, you're cutting yourself short, in my opinion. Was six was outside of sixty five pound braid. So. Um, I think we got setups out of the way. We got still got a lot of questions and stuff here, but we're going to be sitting here trying to, I've, I've been glancing at them. We're going to be getting through all these questions without having to necessarily pull them all up. I'm going to tell you, cause, cause we're getting, we're going to be getting real in depth. We're only 20 minutes into this thing. We've picked out our rod. We have our rod. We have our line. We have all the stuff that we uh, need to throw a jig. Now, what do each one of us here look for? When we're going to pick a jig up to use, what kind of jig are we looking for? Line tie, weed guard, hook size, wire tied skirt, rubber banded skirt, braided tied skirt. What is it? What is one that you are most confident in and most comfortable with and why? Casey? You know, I, I have it. some sitting here, so if you want to grab one, grab tied one. Skirt. I really do. But as much as I throw a jig and say people, they're just like, uh, I want to I want to run through them, they'll bite the rubber band skirt. Same color, same everything. Uh, a lot of the times, I'll be honest, there's, there's times to where I'm so precious with them nowadays to where I'll hang on to one for three weeks, a month, you know, and that's me fishing, say, six times total mm -hmm. know, in that time frame. I feel like that the hook will also get dull, and that's why sometimes I'll go to the smaller hook also mm -hmm. whenever it comes to that part of it. But I love a 3-8 uh, Arky style head with a 4 alt hook in it. Uh, PB&J is my go-to, and I'm looking for the rock. I just I can't get away from it. A lot of people <laughs> love the brush. I do, too. I would love to scan over there and be like, oh there's some fresh brush throw over there but my confidence is going to be in the rocks and that's going to be from i mean yeah you can dip off down to 30 but my cricket rarely sees 30. after about 25 my patience is let up and i'm coming in and i'm looking for those shadow drops you know from the sun uh the right river channel point or uh channel swing to where baits hanging up there you know uh you can cruise across through there y'all see a thermocline whenever y'all get on the water uh you can cruise across through there and find thermocline for 300 yards you find this random point there is no thermocline on it it is just clean as can be keep scanning scan over there in 20 25 foot of water there's fish everywhere mm -hmm. you know and just just so happen there's one hole that we call it the 1057 hole because weigh ins at 11 and it's literally right there from way in but i'll pull in there about 10 57 right before you gotta crank up an aisle around the corner to the buoy catch one every time it may be a 12 inch maybe a four pounder money hole yeah do you get caught up in the line time we guard any i don't know uh the we guard i don't like those ones like so certain ones that you'll see like I, I'll even enjoy that, but me myself, I would grab a hold of that and I would just show it in the camera. Pick that up, show it. So that's you see how it's straight. That's it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but me, I'm just so particular to where I would rather it be laid down there to where I know it's hard to see that, but I would rather it be laid down right there on the hook needle, and I just feel like that gives me that little bit more. Now, the big bite, they should have a big mouth. They should be able to handle it. There's also sometimes to where I sure would love a 
12 to 13 inch or because I have three fish and I've got an hour left to go. Yeah. You know, and so whatever it takes, I'll kind of bump it down. And I've also learned in whatever kind of mold that you are trying to buy or what jig you're trying to build or mimic, if you can find that one to where, just like I saw, like this one is a little bit smaller. And I know that that jig is to make it the way it's made to stand up. But whenever I get them, I'm relentless about it. I'll even take a wire, like whenever I would be trying to fish brush and just pull that down a little bit, if I can't get it to pry down there and it's that stiff. But I just want that closed down on it. And I feel like I can come through so much more cover that way whenever it comes to the uh, weed guard. Okay. Farmer, mm -hmm. what about you? When you're looking for a jig, what are you looking for? When I when I pick up a jig, usually I'm looking for your brim eaters. I'm looking in your lay downs. I'm looking in your channel swing banks and creeks and stuff like that. I'm looking for those large mouths that are staged up eating brim. So I'm looking big jig, big fish. So you so you're talking in terms of the actual hardware to the jig, wire tied. Wire tied. I want a wire tied jig just because I feel like the skirt holds up better. Um, especially the places that I like to put a jig. Um wire tied, five alt hook, um, three eighths ounce or bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um do you get tied up in the in the wire in the line tie? If I'm fishing heavy, heavy, heavy brush, I'll go vertical because it'll come through easier. But if I'm fishing just going down the bank, I'll have a horizontal on. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good a horizontal will skip better than a vertical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will. I think a lot of people get. Um, I think a lot of people get a little bit too, you know, kind of mm -hmm. set in their ways on certain jigs. You know, we've got we've got several different styles here. You know, we've got a little bitty, this is a little bitty tiny football, like a mini flip style, you know, like the little bitty tungsten ones. It's not tungsten, but it's just a little bitty. It's got a little bitty hook there. You know, it's, it's, it's real <clears throat> little. Um, it's got a trimmed weed guard on it down to it. Just a little bitty football with a wire keeper. Got a little three out hook in it perfectly fine whatever works another one's like got like a horizontal line tie like this one right here it's got a horizontal line tie it doesn't have a vertical line tie and it got you know a medium weed guard in it um i'm a big proponent of the medium weed guards i like the medium weed guards more than the heavier weed guards um just because the medium weed guards tend to deflect a little bit better than the than the stiffer heavier weed guards um, that's just, you know, from my experience of doing it, the biggest thing for me too, on a jig, whether you build jigs or you buy jigs is a double collar and all the ones that I make here, uh, here at true grit tackle, you know, they have a double weed guard on them just like, so, or I mean a double, uh, a double, um, uh, excuse me, not a double, a double weed guard, a double collar, just like this one right here. You got a place for the skirt and you've got a place that'll hold your trailer on there really really good and of course this is a good sharp vmc five out hook right here hook size i like a medium wire hook most of the time until i get into some heavier stuff um casey has the the uh the georgia jig in his hand it has a bit thicker of a of a, of a hook in it so it's a little bit you know stiffer especially in terms of uh, pulling a fish out of heavier cover um and, you know, of course, we'll get into the footballs here a little bit later. I'm sure I don't personally throw a football jig. I think they're a waste of time. But, well, you know, that's just me. Two areas. Um, but that's just me. That's me. Trailers. We've already seen a couple comments about trailers. So well, trailers. Like this is where it's going to start getting complicated. And this is where <laughs> we're probably going to either have some similarities or we're going to have some differences of opinion. So if you only had one trailer to fish, what's going to be your one trailer? Uh, Zoom creep. A zoom creepy crawler. What about you, farmer? The Gary Yamamoto grub. Okay. That's kind of pretty much what I see. Same action. <laughs> same action. Same exact action. Twin tail grubs, whether it's four inch or five inch, they get bit. Now let me uh, let me do say something about a weed guard. Go for as it. As far as um That's what we're here for, baby. Them too, yeah. instead of just if I'm fishing open water or I'm fishing rock and I, it's just like a football head, I will actually trim the front i'll just take a, a pair of scissors and take 
six, seven, eight uh, guards or things out makes that weed guard a lot lighter. So it's easier to set the hook. Um, not as much, you don't have as much resistance, but if I'm fishing heavy grass or wood or something like that, I'll keep my weed guard completely full. So when I pull that jig through that wood, it's not having a tendency to roll over and bend that weed guard down and get catch the catch that wood or whatever it is that you're pulling through. Um, that's a good Tri point. Trimming your weed guard can help you land a few more fish as far as open water goes, mm -hmm. especially if they're just kind of picking up and just kind of lazily holding it. Mm -hmm. And they will do that. Yeah. They will do that. One of the biggest things that I get asked questions to, and, and I guess it's just because this is just the way that it is with a lot of people that don't fish jigs, people get caught up on the bite. They don't understand the bite. They, you know, they're so, and most of the time, and I'm not saying this to be in a negative way, but a lot of guys who don't fish jigs and don't have any confidence in jigs, they worm draggers, they worm fishermen. That's just the, that's just the fact of the matter is, is you're going to be worm draggers. How do you detect a bite when dragging a, a dragging a jig through ruck or bro or rocks or brook? Good Lord, listen to me tie up my tongue. How do you detect a bite when dragging a jig through rock or brush? I promise you when they bite it, you'll know that they're biting it. <clears throat> and just like he said the other day when we were having a conversation, a fish does not have hands. They don't have pockets. They don't have elbows. They don't have feet. When you feel them, you better bone them. Mm -hmm. You what, better. What I've noticed as far as like people that are worm draggers or don't fish a jig much, when they're coming over a rock or they're coming over a limb on a lay down, first thing they do as soon as that jig pops off they drop their rod tip they lose all contact yep. with that jig completely so when you pick up again and you feel it get kind of spongy or heavy then you get that oh moment of oh that was a fish when he drops it when you bring it over that brush pile limb or you bring it over that rock don't drop it have it a control what they call a controlled slack line it's just got a slight bow to it let that jig drop back down in there. So when that fish grabs Keep your rod it, at an eight or nine o'clock position. When that fish grabs it, it's gonna that line's gonna jump. Yeah. And you're gonna you're gonna notice it. You're gonna be a line watcher fishing a jig. Mm -hmm. Cause that line will jump. You'll know reel down, set the hook. Don't don't pull up, go there he is. He reel down again. Ah, he's still there. No, as soon as you seen that line pop, reel down, set the hook. Well, I want to touch on something before I let it go, go. With exactly what he was saying. And that is what uh, I have learned. And what I got to learn was, of course, bite after bite after bite. Watching live scope blew me away because I would throw my jig out there and I would watch it be falling. But if I held my rod, like I cast it out there, even if I give it slack and I'm holding my rod in the upward position, that jig is just Y'all, it is so slow. I don't care if it's on 15 pound test and it's three eighths. It's so slow. Point your rod at the water mm -hmm. and watch what happens. If you're trying to get to the bottom, now don't get me wrong. You're gonna you're gonna be like, uh, oh, there he is on a few bites to where they hit it on the way down. But the amount of time that you're gonna save that your jig instead of it just kind of gliding to the bottom because you're holding that slight bit of tension up to it. So exactly what Farmer was saying when that fish grabs a hold of it. If you just set your rod tip down, then you just gave him double the weight that he thought he had in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering, uh, it's a little bit fishy. You know, he may spit it out immediately mm -hmm. and they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, open their mouth, shake their head, and they're out of there. You never even got a hook in him or anything. So that contact with that line and understanding your fall rate and what's mm -hmm. going on there and what happens whenever your rod tips up and when it's down – really matters to jig fishing it does it does pay, pay a lot of attention to like he said with your fall rate when you're when you're pulling up over a limb say in a lay down and you're you've got to pick it up four or five foot to get that thing over that limb and it only falls uh, falls about another foot he's got it yeah reel down set the hook Hook sets are free. I know jigs aren't, but hook sets are free. Jigs aren't free, but hook sets are free. And and, and one thing that I'll tell you too about a jig is, uh, and we're going to get right here to the head weight difference right here because I was actually going to say that, but I wanted to piggyback off what they said too. 
you know, a lot of the jig bites, you know, when they first get it, they get it. That's what they got it. That first that that you feel. He's got it. There's no, oh, there's a bite. And then piddle fart with him. No, he's got it. It's not none of this worm fishing where you go, let him eat it. It's yeah. He's got no, it. No, he's got it. He has sucked it into his mouth. And all you got to do is go watch a uh, a very good video from uh, um, Tactical Bassin about how fish eat, how bass eat jigs. Every single one of them suckers go, and they grab it. And they put it in their mouth. Now, they'll spit that thing out. Good Lord at the candy this man's going to brought with <laughs> He's got, he's got all kinds of candy. Is, is, that a trailer? Is, is that a trailer? Is that right a trailer here? right there? Is that a rainbow trailer? I ain't never tried that one. On the back. Rainbow yeah. chunk. It caught know. me, though. Hey, you might have to slide me some of them over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I got you, bud. Um, so, but outside of that, you know, one of the biggest things that I tell people, though, you know, a lot of your, a lot of your quality keeper size fish they will, you will feel them bite a jig, especially mm -hmm. if you have a good sensitive rod. You will feel that. Boom, boom. Damn, there's one. Mm -hmm. Biggest mistake I see people make on a jig is that reel down and feel for them. Yes. Pick up and it's like, there he is. And then all of a sudden you feel this, the, and he's gone. Yes. But where I have seen with people with me in my boat, where I have seen people screw up the most. And they have missed a fish of a potential. And most likely, what this is no this is no joke. Where they have potentially missed a fish of a lifetime, they lose contact with their jig. They don't know that it never got it. They never feel the bite. I, I don't we know. have the most sensitive rods that you can buy nowadays. The technology and the equipment is there, but still, big old large mouth will grab that thing, and you will have no earthly idea that they have it. I don't know how many I've watched that I've had in the boat with me as far as, like you said, losing contact with a jig and they're just sitting there working it like they would. And mm -hmm. the line's going off to the left they're swimming off and they're still working the bait towards them. And I'm like, Hey, your bait's over here. Swing. <laughs> yeah. They're swimming off with the, with the jig. When they swim off with these things are really good, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> um, when they swimming off with a jig, is where a lot of people miss. I'm telling you though, this is if y'all learn anything from me, heed my advice on this and heed my words on this. If you lose contact with the jig and you do not feel a thump, there ain't no two pounder got it. A groaning has it. A big one has it. Them large mouth, especially large mouth, they have a tendency to grab that thing. Their mouth is so big, they will suck it in from a foot away. And you will never feel them get it because they will just get it and they will hold it in their mouth and you'll never know it's there. Mm -hmm. If you see that happens, you better be ready to go because it is game on. Because when you cross its eyes, when you think you're going to cross its eyes, she's going to pull you back. And she's going to go straight back to where she came from. 99% of the time, she's going to go straight right back into the whatever that thick, nasty cover is, that blow down, mm -hmm. that brush pile. She's going to go behind that big old boulder that she was sitting on, and she's going to be gone. She's going to take you lunch and your lunch money all at the same time, guaranteed. She's going to take you to school. She will. I got took to school with money before last. Did you? Yeah, on Alatoona, I've never really had that many uh, five-pound largemouth topwater bites and I got one, and I got my chance at it, and I had it on 40-pound smackdown, and I honestly believe that uh, I think it come through my snap ring or my, my split ring on the front Yeah, I had my bait tied to. I honestly think that my braid come through it, and then I stretched it out because, uh, of course, I had my drag sank all the way down because I was fishing 40-pound braid on top of it. Like, now you're coming to me, you know. Got to fight him for, I don't know, five or six seconds and took my bait to me mm. a little angry. No, you're a little bit angry. Yeah, you told me about that. Got my heart broke. You told me about that. Yeah. Um, jig trailers, though, you know, that's the next thing that we're really going to get into. And we've already had a couple of comments and asked questions about jig trailers. Jig trailers, baby. Um, there's all different kinds of jig trailers. There are hundreds of different jig trailers. If you want to have success in North Georgia in particularly, with a jig, 
a double tail grub. Twin tails. A twin tail grub. Four or five inch twin tail grub. By far, you will get more bites on that. That little puppy right there. You will get more bites on that than you will anything else. I'm going to say this, and I probably shouldn't say it. Dip a little bit. Tell but, them. Well, no, not even that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a there is a wrong way to rig a double tail grub. Yep. Yes, sir. You there is a wrong way to rig a double tail grub. Farmer, go for it. <laughs> when you hold up a double tail and you hold it like it's going to sit on your uh, jig, flip it over. There's going to be one way that they fold into each other. You don't want that facing up towards your hook. They're not going to swim well. If you flip it over and it gets wider, that's the way your hook's wanting to face. That's the way to throw it. They're going to spread out and fall like this. They're not going to fold in on each other and not do any action at all. If you if you uh, try to just pick up a double tail grub, throw it on there, you're messing up. I have watched hundreds of YouTube professional fishermen, pros, YouTubes, whatever nobody ever talks about that nobody ever talks about that and i see so many people rig a twin tail trailer the wrong way upside it's, down. Upside it's upside down, down. it is upside down Backwards people just put it on down, there and they there think whoo and the reason why i grab these pb and j ones is because the brown is where it's supposed to be that's going to be on top of the jig the purple is on the bottom so when you rig that thing like the farmer said, if you rig it and it's sitting on that jig and it looks like it's on the inside, so just like this, you've got it backwards. Flip you need to around. flip it over and you need to put it on there the right way. In terms of, I've seen a couple of people, they're having a conversation in the comments right now about port frogs, port chunk trailers. I mean, I, it's the original trailer. I it, mean, is. it works. The original Jig and chunk, or jig and pig, jig and pig, jig and pig or whatever you want, it, whatever from. they call it, jig and pig. I have personally never thrown a pork trailer. I like them in certain times of the year, winter when they don't want any action at all, or dead of summer when all they're seeing is dang baits just going nuts. Mm -hmm. Right now, I will throw something with no action at all. That's give them something they haven't seen day in and day out yeah yeah so that's when i usually go to a chunk yeah if you had to uh if you only had to pick uh one color of of trailer no matter what color jig you got if you only had to pick one color trailer what color trailer are you picking off the shelf casey am i allowed to have jj's in my boat yes green pumpkin okay green pumpkin Anything else? Uh, I like the Rage Crawl, Alabama Crawl, the mini one for around here. And say you're fishing nighttime or uh, say you go, say you like to fish the blue crawl. Uh, it's like the green pumpkin with the blue swirl yeah. in it. That uh, Rage, the mini Rage 2. Mm -hmm. got, they got that blue swirl. Yeah. So that one right there is a Lanier, Carter's, Blue Ridge, all around killer. Yeah. But. The Alabama crawl is hard to beat, but another one for like, uh, say you're in the grass, not the mini uh, rage crawl, but the regular size. I think it's a four or a mm -hmm. five inch. Uh, I think they're five inches. Summer crawl. The summer, summer crawl, crawl is hard to beat. That little bit of chartreuse, a little bit of green pumpkin, mm -hmm. already done for you. Looks uh, brimish. A little brimish. Looks brimish. <laughs> Looks brimish. <laughs> Looks brimish. <laughs> Those brim eaters, they come yeah. in. That's right. There's mine. S Farmers, cinnamon black. Brian Mark Houston said cinnamon. Cinnamon black. Cinnamon black. Uh, yeah. okay. Cinnamon black is hard to that beat. That or the dark, the dark green pumpkin. Cinnamon black is hard to beat. I like green pumpkin. I like cinnamon black. If you go look through my boat in terms of trailers, I have Yamamoto's. I have spot stickers. I have uh, tricksters. I have zooms, twin fat Alberts, zoom creepy crawlers. But I primarily only have about two colors and that's cinnamon and green pumpkin I Casey, answer that one do I you dip it. do I, you dip your, all your trailers and jj's i do not i uh, like 
my green pumpkin when I'm on that brim bite, say I'm on that like three eighths ounce brim bite, and y'all seen them. We've all seen them at the dock. I mean, what chartreuse? Yeah. The, the tail. That the tail. What is that? Three eighths of an inch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Something there. Just that very little. I literally take my JBJ's lid, and I know, I guarantee you, there's a hundred bass fishermen, you know, that have done the same thing. Just the lid. Don't even. You don't even got to get it down in the jar. As soon I've as you take the lid off. You literally touch the bottom of your green pumpkin creepy crawler to it, barely touch it to it. I'm not talking about like the real stained up stuff. Yeah, you can just go ahead and sink it to the hook then, you know. I've gotten away from the dips. I've gone to the pins because I can be that much so more precise. accurate. I can yeah. be so yeah. precise yeah. with them. I don't have to. A lot of mine's at night, so I'm just kind of like, eh. Biggest mistake you see people make when dipping, dipping their tails. I feel like much. that's a there's a big controversy with that. It just depends, but they'll definitely dip it too much. Mm -hmm. But if you've got them and they're just eating a jig and you're having a or they're not eating a jig and you're just literally you've tried the little bit, you've tried to be Picasso, you know, you've tried to draw it out beautiful. There's sometimes to where bad as I hate to say it, they're making a mistake. But then again, they're swinging for the fence. Mm -hmm. So they're fishing the jig. What it, They've done tried everything else. So now we've got that bottle and we've sunk our jig to the hook. Yeah. That can be a large mistake for some of those fish because I'll be honest with you, I feel like that there's trout when it comes to brains mm -hmm. and then there's spotted bass. Yeah. And that's that's just how I feel. I may be totally wrong, you know, but those when it comes to vision. But those spotted bass... They'll, uh, they'll put a hurting on a lot of the other uh, categories of bass, and I strongly believe that whenever it comes to their senses. Strongly believe that. Yeah. I've I've got a trick, and Ryan's seen me do it. I think Dane's seen me do it. As far as chartreuse goes, a lot of people dip the tails, everything like that. I actually keep a pack of chartreuse Yamamoto Senkos in my boat, and I cut just – a half an inch of a chartreuse cinco threaded up on my jig first then put my twin tail above it so as that jig falls that chartreuse is covered there's not they don't see anything it looks natural looks like a brim or anything like that but as soon as that thing hits the bottom and those that the jig skirt fans there's a pop of chartreuse all of a sudden and those fish will key on it and just eat it it's something they don't see it's something that I used to keep close to my vest, but ain't no point in it anymore. I mean, I've caught more. It's out there now. I've caught more big fish doing that than I have just dipping the tails. Even white. Hey, hey, white, even white, white, the white, red, yep. orange, any kind of just a pop of color when that skirt opens up. We'll make those fish that are nose down on it, and it's all of a sudden you get a pop of color. They'll eat it. Hey, farmer. Yes. You want some proof in the pudding? What? I caught my PB shell bass doing that after you told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> gotta work. It's gotta work. It's gonna work. Cold hard facts. It's gonna work. Listen, I'm the thing about uh, you know, with dyes is you know, I pretty much only have like two, and I pretty much only use uh chartreuse. And I use uh, orange, and that's pretty much about all. Yeah, that's about all I use is like methylate orange or um, um, chartreuse. I use chartreuse more times than not. Um, I don't know why. If I'm not using chartreuse or orange, I'm throwing it straight out of the package the way that it is. I do. I will use, and I'm probably the only one who does this here. I will use the bang crawfish spray when I know they're eating crawfish. If I see that they're eating crawfish, I see them spitting up. I will use that stuff. I don't know about you guys, but. Uh, when I first started, I would definitely use the bang. Yeah. I felt like there was that advantage there. And of course, I was a lot of it was fishing on carters and yeah. blue ridge. So you're doing anything for about this time of year. Yeah. But as I got a little bit older and my cricket got a little bit deeper, 
as much as I love to fish four foot deep, kind of got to get out there every now and then, you know, and get pretend those rocks are in four foot, but really they're in 25. Yeah. You know. Yeah. A lot of jig fishing too is, uh, someone asked me why not red, I'll answer that in a second. Um, a lot of, a lot of people when the terms of jig fishing, it's more of a mental, it's more of a mental thing. Um, I don't know if they can, I don't know if they can mentally get over fishing a jig or if they just mentally can't come to terms with fishing a jig. I really don't know kind of where that lies for me. A jig was something that I picked up at an early, early stage in my life when I started kind of competitively fishing. Um, went fishing with a guy. He took me and, uh, you know, uh, he, he basically, to shoot it straight, he kicked my ass on a jig. He, he kicked my ass on a jig. And that was kind of like this eye-opening experience for me. I was 17, 18 year old boy, and I was like, "Dude, I got to do this." And um, the particular wombo combo for me, and this was how I started throwing jigs. And they do not make them anymore. Um, they do not make them anymore. I have a bunch of them, and I keep them close to me, and I get them any opportunity I can find them is the creepy crawler the oh, Yam gee. the yamamoto mini skirt three in three and a half mm. inch mini skirt with a four or five inch double tail yamamoto grub skirt on the Thank or tail on the back and you only need two colors you only need cinnamon black flake and green pumpkin black flake um i like those I have a bunch of them still. Anytime I can find them, I buy them. They do not offer them anymore. They do not sell them anymore. Yamamoto quit selling them. But I'm going to tell you what. When I was growing up, competitive, started competitively fishing, there was a reason why you, we had to drive down to Hammonds in particularly and go buy bags of those skirts. And looking back at it now, you know, it's like we took advantage of it where we said, you know, oh, it's going to be a forever thing. Looking back at it now, it's almost like I wish I'd every time they had a peg full, I wish I just bought every damn one of them they had at the time because you just can't find them anymore. To me, the creepy crawler is the ultimate, ultimate hybrid jig. You have a full size kind of skirt that's shorter, but then you can also get with the finesse style. And then you also have a smaller profile. I've caught fish this big on a creepy crawler. I've caught six pounders on a creepy crawler. It works. It is something that is for you guys out here that are watching and listening. If you've never heard of it, I'll not be shocked if you haven't. There has literally been here, just here in North Georgia, millions of, and millions of dollars have been won on the exact setup that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. A bag of jig heads, just like this. A bag of jig heads. A bag of creep. A bag. I grab a bag of Yamamoto mini skirts and a bag of double tail grubs. Mm -hmm. Well, they still kind of got the same thing, but it's a lot more finessey now. It's just the spider jig. It has. It has. Um, you don't have the double skirt like mm -hmm. you do with a creepy crawler. No. Um, but spider jig, I mean, I throw a spider jig a lot. If if I'm getting bit on a full size jig or finesse jig, but I'm when I pull, I'm my tails are gone. I'll switch over to that spider jig yeah. and start putting them in the boat. Yeah. Well, you were with me last year, mm -hmm. and we rolled up to a place, and I said I'm gonna get one right here, and I threw that creepy crawler out there, <laughs> and I stuck one. You stuck it. And I stuck one right there and I said, all right, we got our one right here. We got our limit because we needed one to mm. fill the limit out that morning. We already had a, a five pounder. You called about one, nearly four. Mm -hmm. And then we had caught a couple other ones we that were, were two pounds. More. We were just looking for one more. And then we were going to go do our thing the rest of the day. Um, I will say this though, for me in the past little while, between all three of us that are sitting here, my 
ability, and I'm not afraid to admit this, but my ability to willingly catch fish on a jig right now is at an all-time low. Where I'm going with this, do you guys think that... That's why you put yourself third? I'm sorry I wasn't trying to interrupt. No, you're fine. Come on now. You're fine. Don't you give up. That, oh, I know, but listen. <laughs> Never give keep up. Throwing. Keep chunking. Listen to me. Listen to me. I used to get bit at wheel on a jig. That was what I threw to catch a fish. Not no shaky head, not no drop shot. That was what I threw to catch a fish. And I've been having issues with that the past year for me. And that is just me. But what I'm getting at with this, do you both think, agree or disagree, do you think fishing pressure now with the amount of fishermen that are out here, do you think it is affecting a jig bite? I think it's affecting fishing, period. I mean, every bite. I mean, I don't every know. bite. I think the pressure is just like he's, you know, I'm just following up. I've seen more pressure. fish in the last year and a half, two years, where they will come up and change their mind on a, re a reaction style bait than I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got three pound spots coming up on Lanier, crashing a bait, just crashing bait, and you throw a bait out there. And they come up underneath it and swirl right before they get to it. Mm -hmm. Don't commit. I'm like, all right, what's going on? It's the number of boats that are out there now, the number of presentations they see in a day. I mean, what about if, presentations with this, though? Well, I feel like whenever you hit the cover, it honestly, that's how you coax them. Here, I'll be honest with you. The last uh, couple of times that I've been fishing a jig, which is every time that I fish, but the last couple of weeks, I've literally had to work for them. It's been very, very, very rare that, oh, you bomb it out there, you know, and we're just filling the rocks. No, you got to, like, you got to be the fish. You got to be that brim or be that crawfish or whatever it is. You literally have to picture that that's what you are, along with keeping bottom contact or cover contact. Don't get in a, a rut of doing the same thing over and over and over. Every cast is the same thing. Throw it out. Mm, drag it back throw it out drag it back maybe throw it out drag it back next cast as you're bringing it back you hit a rock pop it off that rock make it jump like a crawfish mm -hmm. or if you're fishing a deep hump or a deep brush pile when you bring it over the limb instead of letting it fall right back down there stroke that jig off of that limb exactly. make it pop way up over top of the brush pile and come back down in it fish it different don't get in a rut of throwing it out there and dragging it back. Mm -hmm. Like a lot, I've seen, I don't know how many people fish a jig one way. They don't, you've got numerous ways you can throw a jig. How many times have you set the hook on a jig and then, you know, you let off of it. And then right after that, oh, he's back again. Just mm -hmm. like you said, you just stroked it out of that brush or out of that rock pile. You look like a flea and brim that scared to death of that three pounder that I hope's about to bite, mm -hmm. you know? What's a technique with a jig that uh, you use probably the most? And what is a technique style with the jig that you use the least? So we got, I mean, swimming it, hopping it, dragging it. What What is your, what is your most used technique and presentation? What is your least used technique? Stroking it for me probably is the most the least used one the least used just because they've got to set up right for mm -hmm. this for you to stroke a jig you're what you're doing you're imitating a fleeing crawfish mm -hmm. is what you're doing because if you ever watch videos on crawfish when they run or anything like that it's up and out mm -hmm. it's not just across the bottom as fast as they can go it's up and out yeah so when you pop your rod what i do is i'll hit the base of my rod twice once real hard and then pull back to make the jig shoot across but you lose contact with your jig when you're stroking a lot of times and you'll miss fish doing it that way my probably my most used is hopping it across the bottom if i feel something i'll leave it i'll i'll drag or hop it hop it i hit something i let it sit there wherever i hit it then i'll get tension get tension and then pop it off of the cover Mm -hmm. And that's usually when I get a bite on a jig. That's my most consistent 
way of catching them on a jig. What about you? When it comes to me stroking a jig, the only time I feel like I'm really going to be stroking one is when we're at Gunnersville, you know, Chickamauga, try to find some grass. Or so you're hopping it out of the grass. You know, that's whenever I'm stroking is like, I'm, you know what I mean? You're just mm -hmm. snatching it free from all the grass clumps and everything, just hoping one one of those grass clumps turns into an eight pounder. But uh, most of the time, kind of like Farmer said, I'm just, I'm hopping it along the bottom. bottom. I'm wanting to keep that contact. But then again, there's sometimes to where, thanks to live scope, I have learned like my fall rate and sometimes keeping that jig right there above it. Sometimes that, yes, that bottom contact matters. As soon as you're hitting those rocks and as soon as you hit that stuff nine times out of 10, that's whenever your bite's coming. But there is that sometimes that you can dance that thing around there like a ballerina. And they just don't care. Just like he said, they'll just come up and look at it. So sometimes you got to, like he's saying, that hop along the bottom. You know in your mind that you're sitting six to eight inches above the bottom because if you put as much time as us rednecks have on the water, you just kind of <laughs> get a feel for it, you know. Yeah. And it don't it change your cadence up, you know, mix it up. Don't Don't always have the same drag and the same form, you know, just – always be willing to change it. And if they don't like it and you're focused on catching them on the jig, or if you want a big bite, then the jig bites the big bite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And before we get into that farmer, we got one hour into the show and I want Paul Coonan to talk about our uh, second sponsor here for the live well, Paul, take it away and tell us about Adam's renovations. I will do my very, very best tell you about charlie adams and adams renovations we got the fall season coming up maybe you want to watch a little football outside you want to get your patio game on point maybe you gotta need some painting remodeling bathroom done charlie adams he's your man you can give him a call 470-505-3412 or you can hit him up let me look over here on my screen at the email that's adam renovations 20 at gmail.com Adams Renovations, they'll get you taken care of, and they'll get it done the right way. We're proud to have them here on the live well. Ryan, you ready for more? We're ready for more. Let's we're do it. ready to go. So, all right, so we're going to go into this uh, second half of this episode here. I know you guys got a lot of questions, and we're trying to, like this first half, I was trying to answer as many of them without trying to pull them up. I know there's all different kinds of questions about setups and everything that we kind of went over. So, Jig fishing. All right. So you guys come with the questions right here. Any kinds of questions. This is going to be a no holds bar second half of this episode. And we have two people in the peanut gallery. So they have questions as well. Now is the time throughout this second half of the show to ask questions away. And we do have a couple of good jig fishermen that are also in the comment section. I'm not going to throw their names out there unless they absolutely want me to. But one of them, he's pretty damn good with a jig. He's probably one of the best I've ever seen with a jig and uh, he is in the comment section right now. Um, so uh, he's, he's pretty damn good with a jig. He's kicked my ass on one many a time. <laughs> Does his name rhyme with Gerald sizzle? It may, it may, <laughs> it may, it may rhyme with Gerald sizzle. <laughs> that's, that's Mr. Harold grizzle to you. Uh, that man right there, he's a jig, he's a jig fishing fool, as he would say. Mm. Um, and, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things, jig fishing, I would stand to say at this present moment in time in tournaments, turn from a tournament aspect, we'll just say with that, I think a jig has won more money than any other bait ever back in the eighties. If you want throwing a jig, you know, you can watch those old bass masters. So and so's throwing a Stanley jig. It, it was constant. It was a constant thing. The reason why is because this little booger right here is probably the most versatile thing that you can throw. Now, there isn't really a time of the year where it don't work. Some people say, as I was growing up on Lanier, some people said, oh, there's not a jig bite from March through May. 
I had that in my mind there for a minute until finally I picked one up on my own and said, well, I'm going to throw the damn thing. And that's completely false. They eat a jig year round. It is up to you as a fisherman to figure out exactly what you have to go with. Now, imitations. We've already touched on a little bit. We've talked about brim. We've talked about crawfish. I want your opinion on this. What do you think they think a jig is more times than not? And you can go in specifics with times of the year. And I'm going to answer this as well. There are those specific times of year. Of course, there's the red time of year that mm -hmm. we all know about. Yeah. We know what they think that is. You know, that's crawfish mm -hmm. immediately. But there's those other times to where I feel like they're just, uh, they're apex. I mean, they're, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's moving. It's in my area. I will eat it. Yeah. Oh, it's perfect size. Looks like lunch. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the times I feel like it is a instinct or as a lot of people like to call it a reaction bite. But I honestly think it's in their DNA. I think it's that that thing swimming in front of me. It's triggered my lateral lines. Excuse me. It's good. triggered my lateral lines, and I feel like uh, that's whenever they explode on it, not knowing what it is. Now, can we say that we feel like we've went out there in a 20-foot deep rock pile, and we've, we've saw so many brim around through there. You can, you're can you scanning down through there, and you can see the bait down there. And, hey, I mean, they could be, they could be after the brim here. But then there's also sometimes to where I'm sure a lot of people can attest to this before live scope, whenever the ditch fishing, ditch fishing become a large thing, like say on Lanier, you could, you could uh, scan the whole cove, go to there, the, the beautiful, beautiful cove, not one fish would be on there. That's whatever, that's where I would catch a four and a half crawling a jig on the bottom because they are used to those. And another thing about the electronics, I've gotten to where if I'm so confident in an area that I'm in catching, like, and I know what I'm fishing, I'll, I'll take my active and I'll scan it over there to the left. I just kick that thing off to the left. That way it's pinging that mm -hmm. way. I don't even want, that's how crucial bites are to me. I feel like I can gain a bite or two because just so happens, hey, we come in here a little hot before you knew it. We thought we were. 60, 80, 90 foot from this tree or 30 foot from it mm -hmm. or this rock pile, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm too close. scan your stuff over there, check it out, make sure you're good and lined up because a lot of people don't understand is they want to just, and I'm guilty of it too, but you scan out through there and you like, just lock it on it. You don't even move it after you cast out through there. Well, guess what? Of course you want to know if you're watching that screen and you watch the fish bite it, <laughs> Yeah, you can get good enough to watch it bite it and you can learn. But do you know how much easier it is to know that whenever you got that bite, I feel him. I didn't even need to see him on that screen. So after you line yourself up with your rock, uh, point, brush, whatever it is, after you line yourself up and you cast, scan off, scan away from it. If you're not on spot lock, fighting the wind, if you're in a kind of chill area, you know what I mean, to where you can – you don't have to be spot locked. Scan it over there to the left because guess what? Either you've wasted your bomb cast that you're trying to make and going to reel right back in because you don't like the way that it looks when you're out there, or you're just going to have confidence to know that I've caught a lot of fish here. Like they could be hugging the bottom. One come come from over here that I'm not scoping out. And uh, I feel like I picked up a few bites because of that. I really do. Y'all don't realize how much church they're, you just said that. Right <laughs> <laughs> they're they're really pressure. I know people think that it's crazy, but they know what's going on. And if you understood how much sonar was pinging off of those heads, then it is three, four, five times what any fish has saw since this come out. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not they haven't saw it. I mean, I'm unless, guilty of it. You know what I mean? And me too. I I'm mean, guilty of yes, it. Yes, sir. Ain't no telling how many times I've thrown a damn jig in a brush pile and watched the thing go into the brush pile. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, my God. You don't even realize, you know, until you actually line it up perfectly and throw a jig over top of a brush pile. And you're just like, you watch it and they're suspended over a brush pile. They go straight into the damn brush pile with it. And you're just like, 
waiting and it never happens. It don't happen. Um, I know some people who are really good with live scope with throwing a jig, but um, I, I think I think over the next couple of years, you're going to see a big difference. And um, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if he's watching or not tonight, but you know, uh, uh, Mr. Greg Frulain, he's shared a uh, a, a little sound bite of a uh, I cannot remember who. Uh, uh, who who the professional fisherman was, but he was talking about competing with live scope. I think there's going to become a time here at, at where you know is live scope hindering or helping, and I have it and I use it, but I Tuesday morning I fished. I didn't turn the damn thing on, and I just basically just tried to throw a jig for a little while because I had a bait. I was give some baits uh, for those of you guys that follow us on TikTok. I was given some baits and uh, there was, some of them was a crawfish trailer type thing from jaw tech bait company out in Texas. And it's a good little, it's a good looking crawfish. It's, it's got the small pincers on it, which is a lot of what you see with the second and third in star style of crawfish. And I was just using it, but I never even turned my life scope on. I got bit twice. And that's the most bites that I've had in the past two months on a jig in one day. And that's just coming from me personally. And I s go ahead. Say what you want to say. I still kind of do it the old school way. Um, I have live scope. I'll use it in the wintertime a lot. But when it gets hot, I still do it the old school way. I've got a brush pile marked and I've got it triangulated. Mm -hmm. I've got a place on the bank. I've got another marker out out from it so i can set up on that brush pile in a triangle whichever which way the wind's blowing that's another thing i will not throw with the wind i throw against the wind no matter what i'm doing because mm -hmm. um, you can stay set up on it but triangulate it i don't have my sonar on i'm as quiet as i can be because i i think these fish are getting so used to the boat traffic and forward facing sonar that ping hitting off of them getting that return that they're starting to get used to it they're, oh there's a boat over here mm -hmm. let's hunt i've seen i don't know how many where i've pulled up just to look at the brush pile and see look with my live scope at the brush pile and watch them go from the top of the brush pile to go in it or gone yeah yeah the reason why i asked that though is because when you when you pick up one of these things right here and you guys can agree or disagree with me. When you pick up a jig, it is one of the very few techniques out there that we utilize in bass fishing to catch little big green fish. That when you pick, as soon as you bend down and pick that rod up and undo that jig off the keeper and get ready to throw it, you are immediately like this. You are elbows deep into it. It is a very, very personal, very, very, contact orientated presentation bait it is not throwing a swim bait out there it's not throwing a top water it's not even dragging a worm because the worm fishing is just like you know worm fishing is you know it's its own thing it's its own little thing you know it's you know, the, the big deal is you know someone pull out the shaky head or pull out the carolina rig and drag a worm you know drag the old ball and chain around the quitters rig this isn't a quitters rig this is something that if you get so dialed into it that if you're a tournament fisherman and you get the right bites on it and someone beats you on doing something different, all you can do is tip your hat to them mm -hmm. because they beat you doing something completely different. You pick up. You this pick will up, beat more times than not. This will win. You pick up a jig. You're swinging for the fence. Yes. You're swinging for that four five six plus fish mm -hmm. to eat that day yeah when y'all fish in a tournament what what do y'all want to do when y'all go to that tournament you want to win you want to win. win and what does it take to win big fish swing for the fence you gotta swing for the fence Get so the big it fish. takes that big bite before you can even think about now don't get me wrong if you're in a points trail or you're in a tournament trail and you need your five 100 i get it go look for those five i've gotten so accustomed to it that I strongly believe if I can just keep looking for that big bite, then I feel like those 
the fillers will come. There is one thing I want to touch on that we, we talked trailers a little bit, but we kind of just, we were going to get back into it. So go ahead. You might as well lead us into it. Um, especially if I'm fishing around docks where I know there's a lot of brim bluegill, some type of panfish. Um, you can still throw your grub or double tail. You can throw your uh, cross style baits. It'll work just as well, but a beaver for me around docks. I mean, yeah, it's still mimicking a crawfish, but that thick body, that wider body on a jig as it's fallen mimics brim better than any other brim style bait that I've seen as that thing falls. Mm -hmm. And with a, you got the swimming style, uh, beaver style bait. I think reaction innovation makes, uh, what the, it's the kinky beaver or what. Yeah. They got a couple uh, different versions. Yeah, of Yeah. And I then like the one that's got all the little things coming off. Yeah, the back. I think, What's it called? I think I that's forget. the kinky beaver. Yeah, that might be it. And, um, but I throw and, if you get more surface area, you get more surface area also with a beaver style bait. I can skip this thing 15 more feet than I can with just a grub tail on the back of a jig. I can get this thing to move. I saw your video and I enjoyed that. <laughs> he really did good. Farmer's you been doing it. some 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 work on his Facebook. Y'all need page. to check him out. He yeah. was he was spitting some juice the other. What day. about this? Straight no, tail okay. crawl or yeah. the that actually has a lot of action. A lot of people see it, and it don't, they don't think it's got a lot. Of, that thing actually moves a ton of water when it falls. The, is that the Berkeley? That's the Berkeley Chigger Crawl, ain't it? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. We got a good question too. We need to hit right here from Guy B. So, but what about this? I I throw it a lot. Um, yeah, they, they spell. <laughs> it's great for nighttime fishing. Great for so you nighttime. like them at night. You you can because of the amount of water that it moves, mm -hmm. it's really good. Uh, for say seventies, seventy to eighty degrees. After you breach that eighty, that's when I'm probably going to the creepy crawler. I actually fish this one a lot in current in rivers because weird. the plastic is so thin on those those crawls. If you've got current, they're continually just doing this in the mm -hmm. current, even when it's on the bottom. So it's always moving. Yeah. That. Go ahead. It's the same thing with the double tail grub. It's a thin plastic, so it's always going to be moving in the current. Yeah. But I like, I'm a river rat this time of year. Yeah. Looking for the cooler water. Looking for that cooler water, looking for that bigger fish. Let's ask this question right here up here at Guy B. We're going to get to the tungsten question. Don't worry. Um, well, hit Neil Scoggins first. Do you think. We'll ever see a tournament trail where it won't be allowed. I know some small tournaments are happening now that don't allow it when you in terms of the live scope. I think it's just a tool like and I think any true fisherman that does not have it, I would love for them to be able to step on somebody's boat that has it and try to go catch them with it. Mm -hmm. Because you will literally feel like you don't have it. What it does do is it te teaches you fish's behavior where they like to hang out. It's kind of like, okay, Say if guys love to go deer hunting, what are they going to do? They're going to have 15 trail cameras out. They're going to have corn out everywhere. They are learning their habits. They'll go sit in the woods sometimes with no gun, no bow, no nothing. They just sit there and watch them come through. Kind of the same thing with live scope. You're, you go from, you are now hunting mm -hmm. them and learning. That does not mean that you can get them to bite your cricket. No. Nope. Unless you try to mic long one with a treble. Never had that much success, my friend. Oh, the only thing I ever tried to treble was a game. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we don't want to open up that can of worms. Guy B down there, he has a he has a good question, and uh, it says, "If I wanted to gain confidence in a jig, what type of structure or conditions should I key in on?" Rock. For you, it's rock. What about you? What was the question? I Dang it, farm. Sorry. If I wanted to gain confidence in a jig, what type of structure or conditions should I key in on? As far as, uh, like he said, rock, um, but my big one is I like the close quarter combat stuff. I like flipping and lay downs and docks and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's usually where I have my most success with a jig. Yeah. In terms of conditions, what's your favorite time to throw one? Cloudy, sunny, rainy, yeah. foggy, windy. Yeah, matter. Don't matter. Lightning. Don't matter. I prefer, I will say this, I prefer sun. 
if I get high skies sun, I like sun better because it seems to stick the fish closer to cover. Shade lines start becoming a lot more important in the sun. Yeah. And if you're just wanting to kind of get the feel and put yourself in a higher percentage area of potentially getting bit, working shade lines, working cover was typically on a sunny day is typically a good standpoint because we've been fishing and, and it's hard for us three to sit here at this table and go, you know, oh, you don't throw a jig. It's hard for us to say that because we throw them and we throw them religiously, even though some people like me suck at it right now catching fish on one but we throw it still religiously i may not be able to catch much on one right now and haven't been able to catch one much on it for the past couple of months but the damn thing has not left the deck of my boat it's still there it's still there it's okay. always there it so is always bloodstream there. and you know because that's <laughs> what you started with so sometimes like i don't know i forget who it was but somebody told me this the other day uh get a little bit older in life like our you know what I mean? Our spectators, our, our peanut gallery that we have over here. You know what you got to do? You got to do what you did when you were a kid to have fun. Because last night I went and played softball with my brother, and I had some of the funnest times in my life in a brief moment and with him. So take it back to old school. That's why that jig's on the front of your boat. You might not be catching them on it right now because you're you want that. I know. I mean, I know you. You're throwing that daggum thing up top. It's probably six inches long and got three joints in it with two monster trebles on it. Pick that cricket up and drag it a little bit. Get it. Down <laughs> oh, there. you know me too well, <laughs> uh, Justin Tree. I think if you scroll up some, he's got a question down there. But I think he asked another question up there. Uh, he said, "In position." I don't know if he was making a comment. That was relative to life. Oh, that was relative. Okay, in position versus feeding habits. Okay, so go back down now. Uh, Tracy Coker ledges work well too. Rocks red clay, yeah. Do you change line diameter to change rate of fall to get more bites? I do not change line diameter. Change I change weight and I change trailer size if I want to make an impact on, uh, you know, trailer size. To so piggyback on that, go ahead. When do you guys find it's important to fall faster versus slower? time of year mm -hmm. water water temperature um, hot, hot water you can have a fast fall and they'll react to it here you want cold, that? yeah cold water cold water you want just a little bit slower fall it's yeah. just, uh, that quarter ounce jig comes into play in that colder water and that mm -hmm. that that rage crawl like yeah don't get me wrong i love the three inch creepy crawl on the back of a little quarter ounce but sometimes that slower fall in the winter time it'll really help you and gain you some bites mm-hmm but you um, got the chunk in your hand and the beaver in your hand. As a fall rate goes, the the chunk will actually fall slower mm -hmm. than the beaver, even though you've got more plastic and more uh, disturbing more surface area. The chunk is actually hold uh, catching more water as it falls. It doesn't have as much friction as it falls like this. I was over there in your in your screen. There we go. It doesn't have as much friction against the water as it's falling compared to the uh fall rate fall rate has a lot to do it when the fish are beat you know the fish are there but you watch okay you you throw a a double tail grub in there and that thing goes right through there in a three eighths ounce jig like a missile and they nose down on it and then kind of raise back up okay something's not right then I throw, I usually have two or three jigs tied on, a full-size jig, a finesse jig, and probably like a spider jig or one of those tungsten, uh, the Kitex. We've been uh, throwing the Picasso. Yeah, the Picasso, a little thing. Um, I will actually have a chunk on a full-size jig and a double tail on a full-size jig. And if I don't get one to bite when it screams by it, then I'll throw one that's falling a little slower as it goes by it. If they don't bite it then, then that's when I start messing with my uh, retrieve to see what they want as far as that goes. We haven't left out finesse jigs, so I don't even think we haven't. It's I've been talking about those little ball-headed rascals all night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those things are killers. So in terms of finesse jigs, you know, I make one here with True Grit. Say, that's like a little bitty, little bitty peckerhead jig right here. It's got a little bitty hook. But you know the 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 uh, the Kitek, the little bitty tungsten Kitek ones work really really well. 
the Picasso little spotty. I actually had took Sal Pinto fishing about a month ago and we sat on a brush pile and he threw that thing five straight cast and caught five straight fish. Is he the one that runs that top six deal? No. Or he fishes that top six? Yes. Yeah. He fishes it. Yes. Yeah. Sal Pinto does. Yeah. Um, he's the Beaver Toyota like guy. Yeah. yeah like, oh, Sal's good like dude. Him. He's as good yeah. as gold, man. I yeah. absolutely he's love him. Good little fish. He's a damn good fisherman too. He he is uh he he is an absolute um he he won't admit it but he is an absolute hammer. If Sal's watching. I love you, Sal. You're awesome. Um, we I know we got a couple more questions. We still got some time. Don't worry about that. We'll get to them. In terms of the finesse stuff, though, you know, it seems to be that that little spotty. That Picasso little spotty. That thing right there is deadly. Extremely. It seems to, in the past couple of years, it seems to have had an effect on jig fishing. I'd say 90% of the guys on Alatoona who pick up a jig probably are throwing that little spotty. They went down to the dugout. They picked up little spotties and they've got a boatload of them. They're throwing little things on them, like the little X zone crawls. They're throwing little creepy crawlers on the back. I can't even get my buddy to pour me any anymore. We used to pour them together and he'd I'd go there and he'd be. Now he's just, oh, let me go spend 200 on Picasso's. Yeah, he didn't get for 20 jigs, but yeah, exactly. That's how expensive they are nowadays. Let's make them eight and nine dollars a piece. Um, yeah. So the, the, the finesse stuff, though, they have their time of the year. Me personally, I just don't finesse them. I won't. If I'm going to finesse anything, I'm going to tie on that. I'm going to use that creepy crawler like what we talked about earlier. Um, so we got a question up there, though. Um, do one, I, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Do do what you need to do. A lot of our, when you're talking finesse jigs, too, are you talking finesse footballs like your recess football that you make? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about a ball head? A ball head is a big player around here. It is, and that, and that's kind of the finesse jigs um, is ball heads. They got the short, the thinner skirt that's cut back on them. See, I I throw I throw yours. I throw also throw the balling out jig, G man's mm -hmm. finesse jig. I like I like that one. Trader. <laughs> Just what kidding. color is your favorite in the balling out one you like? Uh, we're actually green, about to get that into that. Pumpkin, uh, Sorry. No, you're good. We're actually green about to pumpkin, get into that. Uh, it's, it's just called that green pumpkin. It's got that like cinnamon and black with that. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. my favorite color. And then the one that kind of looks like a small little brim that's got that blue flake in it. That's yep. my two favorites. So with the chartreuse I belly. I like the blue flake one. Um, but you can also... Or, a lot of people put too much um, emphasis in color, I think, on a jig. I mean, you've got uh, how many jig colors are out there? I mean, you got black, blue, and orange. Uh, orange, pumpernickel, and green pumpkin. Mm -hmm. all, you all you need to start out jig fishing is a brown jig, a green jig, and a black and blue. And they, you're good. Mm-hmm. You brought up black and blue. I was going to say black and blue for last here because that is a uh, that is what I call a unicorn jig. A lot of people don't understand the importance of a black and blue jig. Um, it is important <laughs> if you want to be a jig fisherman. Yes. A black and blue jig is important. Facebook user, I don't know who All you is, need is PB&J. All you need is PB&J. All you need is pb and I love black and blue, and I love all those colors. I love green. I love green and blue. I love green and orange. I love brown and orange. Once, all you need is PB&J. Once you dial in on a jig, then you start messing with your colors to mimic what you're trying to catch. Um, well, we'll take Altoona, for example. This time of year, your crawfish are green pumpkin and with a hint of orange in them. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start seeing a lot of the pump, like a like a true grit jig, the pumpernickel jig, or the fall crawl start picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, in the spring, they are dark green pumpkin with hints of blue. So that's why, I mean, one of my favorite things to throw on Altoona in the winter is just a little black and blue finesse jig. Mm -hmm. With a green pumpkin try or a green pumpkin try to, and I mean it, it gets wrecked. Oh, you, you see, you've already got into it. That's Murph, for sure. So I, Murph knows me. The knows Murphinator. Yeah, he knows. What I'm about here. the Murphinator jig? Yeah. That's the ugly. I, that's the thing. The ugliest Andrew. sin. Um, <laughs> go back up just a little bit. Um, I, I will say this about. The keep Murphinator. on going just a little bit more. Go ahead. 
I will say this about the Murphy Nair. It did catch a big fish up on Notley. It, it did. Was, it was. A Wasn't car. it a carp? It was a carp, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It was a carp. Did, they like did, 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 <laughs> did, did the carp? Did the carp bite the jig, or did the jig bite the carp? That's the. <laughs> that's the real question. <laughs> did the carp bite the jig, or did the carp bite, or did the jig bite the carp? Um, let's see here. So maybe that answered the uh, the question up there. Uh, do you see the difference? Yeah. Do you see? We're gonna get to both of them. Let's do. Do you see a difference in dragging the jig and the brush first pop, popping the jig and the brush in the heat? All on all on the day. It's I mean, day to day basis, it hour seems. to hour, really. Yeah, it I seems mean, it to can change. change. Uh, you're you're in the morning and you're more aggressive. You're popping that thing through that brush, and they're just choking it. Yeah. Well, sun gets up. Now you're losing your tw your tails to your trailer. They're not eating it anymore. Yeah. You start just trying to finesse it through give them more time to pick it up yeah i do more dragging in the winter time than i do anything else where i get really really slow a lot slower and and, and really just kind of barely dragging that thing along um what about skirt modifications as far as size and profile do you ever trim your skirt do you ever do anything to of course it? you trim don't want every skirt i've like, got uh say for instance you're going to get into exactly what I was about to say. If, if you're if you're touching your legs, then this is big, guys. You need to pay attention to this. Zero action there because a lot of the times that, of course, use that full size, but just get it out there, dip it in the water, get your scissors out, make two or three snips. Even if that uh, catches you a, an extra fish, sometimes that matters a lot of the times. But it the Skirt material will kill these legs, and it will make you just like if you rig it upside down. There, there. You might as well have a Carolina rig, and be. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Paul. I'm not great at this Go holding ahead. the microphone up, but Go ahead. it'll kill your legs. You're excited. And, You're forgiven. Yeah, and right. whenever it comes to a jig, I get excited. <laughs> so I wanted y'all to know that you need to trim your jigs and do not let your skirts kill your legs because you do not want to be like Lieutenant Dan. I know these jigs are expensive. I mean, you, you buy a little spotty for seven ninety nine. I mean, that's not cheap for a jig that you're going to be putting down in something you're going to you may lose. But sometimes if you're wanting, you're still wanting that three eighths ounce size, but you're wanting a little more le less skirt material, you can bring that skirt and cut that thing up here on the shank of the hook and get more bites with a jig because now you've taken a full-size jig and made that profile smaller. It's just, if you don't have a finesse jig with you, you can play with a full-size jig, make that thing a finesse jig. It doesn't take much. I mean, take the collar right here where it's tied, get all your skirt material, pinch it right there at the head, cut it. Now you've got a three eighths ounce finesse jig out of a full-size jig. Yeah. All right, here's a good question. Ryan, if you get hung in the brush, how do you get the jig loose? Plug knocker. Plug knocker is one way. Jig gets hung in the brush. First thing people always do, and I always turn around and go, stop it, damn it. <laughs> You're just burying it more. Damn, hung in the brush. <laughs> no. Well, that damn thing's gone. There's five dollars. <laughs> it's gone. Look here. Hung in the brush. Won't come out. Take your rod. Take the butt of your rod just like this right here. Put it right here underneath your forearm. Right there. Put a bow in your line. Don't tighten it up. If you tighten it up, it ain't going to work. That jig's hung. You go right here and just pay attention to my arm right here. That jig's hung in the brush pile. Bow in your line. Pick up. Pick up just like this. Keep this. 
butt of this rod here because if you don't keep the butt of the rod right here as you pick up you will lose it right here and you will basically start to move the rod like this and you will put the pickup action of the jig where the line tie is it will just be trying to pull straight up you want to utilize this weed guard right here to what the whole purpose behind the weed guard is it helps you not get hung it allows you to throw this thing in thick cover a lot of times when you're hung in brush you're actually not hooked yes you're in a a v, a v. and that jig head's just stuck right here so if you pick up like he's telling you and keep that rod hip here. Just pick up. It may pop loose or pick up enough to where and then drop slack in your line. It'll throw slack into it. It's the same thing with that pop method where you bring your line back like this and pop that. That works best on crankbaits. Well, yeah, it baits. works great on the jig too. It sends that slack back in that line and it makes will. it back up. Makes the jig back up out of the V and then you can pick it up out of it. If your boat has moved and you are hung, this technique right here, doing this and picking in the rod tip up like this, get that out of there so you can see me. I'm going to hit farmer in the head. Oh, you, you can do both. Using this right here to create a fulcrum, you will get that jig loose. It does not work nine out of ten times all the time, but it will work about seven out of ten times, and you will save a jig. After this, though, you need to retie. Got a uh, there. There's your big secret on how to save money on jigs. Plug knockers will save you some. Plug knockers will save you too, but you might lose your plug knocker too. Mm -hmm. I've got a brush pile on Lake Lanier that it's got about I don't know fifty jigs in it. You need a hound dog. Well, you've seen you you've seen you've dog. seen my yeah. setup. You've seen my setup for uh, a plug knocker. I actually yeah. took an old rod that broke. I broke it. And I took a, just an old catfishing reel mm -hmm. and put masonry cord on it. And I actually use that as my plug knocker. So when I send that thing down there, I've got that jig tight in my hand. Now I'm hitting that thing as hard as I can. As soon as I feel it hit that jig, I lower both rods and it'll take that jig right off of that limb. And then you just reel up. That's exactly what I do. The same you won't lose you Unless it's buried in something. You won't lose another jig with There's that. There's one out. eye on the rod. I keep one eye on mm -hmm. it. I've got you cut reel. it. You cut it right at the 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 last eye. You cut that rod, and you just use it as a, a little knocker. It save you money. Jigs are getting, uh, jigs are getting. Uh, my, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, nine out of ten to seven out of ten. Uh, I'm saying it won't. I'm saying that what I'm going to say was is it don't always work, but it will work more times than not. More like seven out of ten times, it will get you your jig oh, back. Dane's um, giving me crap. So the other option is to use well rope or line and just drag the stuff to the boat that hasn't seen the daylight in de decades. When um, we went fishing, uh, the last time me and him went fishing, I got hung and I couldn't get it loose. I tried everything, couldn't get it loose. Well, finally, I just got mad and I was going to break the line and go on. I pulled up. Oh, it let loose. I brought I brought up like a I brought up a um, I don't know how I got hung on it, but I brought up a uh, old bucket. <laughs> Five well, gallon, three gallon? No, like a it was a um, like a fifty five gallon drum. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, oh. <laughs> okay, that must have been a twenty pound test. Was that on a true grit jig? It was. <laughs> <laughs> that's them vmc hooks baby that's what, exactly what it's all made for um i you know we we can i wish we had more time really to talk but and and i know you're just messing with me i just wanted to reiterate it back to you uh mr jason jones there but uh we can sit here and talk and talk and talk and talk about jigs but i want to hit this real real big point with this and i want both of you to answer <laughs> farmers getting easy i think you might know what's coming to become a better big to, to become a better jig fisherman what is the number one thing that you need to have in your mind if you want to get better at jig fishing you want to build confidence in it and you want to get better at jig fishing what is the number one thing that you need to do 
to become a better jig fisherman. Throw it. Casey? No, darn. I feel like it's one of those things to where, say, you had no clue about electronics. What would you – you don't get a lot of time to go to the lake, but you want to learn your electronics. You're not too much of a tech-savvy guy, so you want to go out here and you want to learn your electronics. Well, if you have 10 rods rigged up, you're not going to go out there and you're not going to focus on your electronics. You're going to try to catch fish. So it's – you leave your rods at home and you bring one rod – or you just have that much willpower to say, I'm not pulling those rods out today. I'm going to make myself figure out how they will bite this. Because when people telling you and all these guides and all these people are trying to give you these tips and let you know, they're always going to be hitting a crawfish. I don't care what time of year it is. Mm -hmm. When they refer to bait, it's not always just a thread fan or a shad or a heron or aloe. You know, the crawfish are a, major major diet in not just a fish and how they go about themselves but replenishing that's how they really get their nutrients it's just like you uh don't get me wrong that ribeye it looks the best because it's got all that fat marble just rolled right through the middle of it but you know what's better for you and more lean that filet mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong it's going to be good but there's only going to be a small chunk of it or you could have this big guy. That's how these fish, I feel like, are doubling in size, like, say, at Lanier. Now, will the water wars change that? We're all going to be, uh, I guess, scientists and try to figure that out ourselves because I feel like in between the water war and what is potentially about to come, it could totally change the, our, the lake that we love so much right over there. Don't get me wrong, my home's at Alatoona, but... I love me some Lake Lanier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Farmer, go ahead and say it. What? Go ahead and say. Put a jig in your hand and don't put it down. Mm -hmm. Fit, put that thing where you don't feel comfortable putting it. It's made to fish in the junk. Put that thing where you don't feel comfortable putting it. You cannot be scared. You cannot be scared to throw a jig in places where it most likely could get hung up and you could lose it. Um, it is definitely just a technique that if you want to get good at it, you want to get better at it, you want to catch fish on it, you want to have success with it. It is one of the few techniques that you can honestly say you have to go throw it. You know, you have to go throw it. Um, embrace the suck is exactly right. Keep casting and, and uh whatever else he said right there the mm, paul just touched on a good one yeah can't be scared your whole life you can't yeah jig bites the big bite mm -hmm. yeah and if you aren't getting hung there are times where you're just not fishing it right i mean the way i, I the way i learned to get a jig out of just the nastiest stuff i know like on altoona up there by uh, bells ferry I know there's some up on Lanier, just old log jams where all every log that comes out of the river just slams into a one bank. Go put that jig in the very back of that thing and fish that thing out of it. Yeah. That's how I learned how to get a jig out of some of the nastiest stuff, how to fish a jig through the nastiest thing I can fish it through. Patience. Patience. Yeah. Patience is a big factor whenever it comes to fishing a jig because – the fall rate sometimes is going to change dramatically, but whenever you're like us, we're throwing it up there in the dirt. Just like farmer said, we're, we're throwing it in the back of that log jam as far as we can, because we don't know if that eight pounder is sitting back there or if it's sitting right up under the nose of our boat. So if we touch every piece of cover in between there and then I feel like we've done our job and we can move on. Big line, big hook for a reason. You hook a six, seven pounder back in the junk like there, you can go get him. Mm-hmm. You can put that troll motor on high and move your way through that stuff. Yeah. You'll get him. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I said, uh, it, uh, good luck tomorrow, Harold. I know he's getting ready for the, uh, BFL this weekend. So I like what Ron said. You never really buy jigs. You rent them until the lake takes them back. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> that is a good way. Um, but, uh, you know, <sighs> What Denny, uh, Neil Scoggin says right there, what Denny Brown told me, if you're not getting hung, you're not putting it where it lives. That is a thousand percent right. Mm -hmm. 
um, there are men who have made a living using a jig, fishing a jig, not throwing anything else but fishing jigs. Um, it is, you know, like I said earlier in the show, you can hop it, you can skip it, you can punch it, you can drag it, you can swim it. It's versatile. It's versatile. It's probably one of the more versatile baits that you can get. And, you know, a jig, you know, also too is one thing that's overlooked with a jig is a jig is actually, if you work it correctly, is actually one of the more louder baits that you can put in the water. You can bang that thing around. You can pop it off of stuff and it'll make a lot of noise. I'm not a rattles guy. I don't know if either one of y'all two are. Do you ever fish a jig with rattles? Early spring, muddy water. I'm, you will? I'm okay with it, but I, I don't like go out of my way to like put a rattle on it. Yeah. I run across a couple of jigs at the store. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, all right, that yeah. looks pretty good. Toss that around a little bit. One thing I do want to touch on go as ahead. far as the jig fish, and I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic here. Send it, bud. Is how you approach the structure you're fishing with a jig. Mm -hmm. I have seen so many people screw up jig fishing by going up to a lay down. First cast is in the heart of it. Mm -hmm. First cast, my first cast, the way I like to fish, my boat's pretty close to the to the bank. My first cast is to the edge of where it meets the water. My second cast is out just a little bit further on the outlays of the limbs. I will actually fish all the way around the thing on the outskirts. My last cast is in the heart and work that thing through it. Go ahead. You raised your hand. Go ahead. I was just saying five casts whenever you're at it. It just depends. If it's small, lay down, mm -hmm. it's not. But like you're saying, you can't just – because I'm guilty – a hundred times you can ask people that I fish with. I we scan by a tree, like I'm trying to get to the neck. I don't know why, but go, go, go. No. Just like Farmer said, touch those bases, every single one of them out through there. Because sometimes on your fourth, your fifth cast, that's when you're really gonna make them mad and they're finally gonna fire. Or they're so lackadaisical, they're so chill, you literally gotta hit them in the head. Two questions right here. Do you guys trim the hook keepers when you're in stupid thick hydrilla? Football jig is a massive thing for it is. If I'm in area. thick hydrilla, I actually will use a uh, swim jig or the mm. jig yeah. uh, because the uh, the nose is pointed, so it'll mm -hmm. come through that grass. I mean, they make a flipping jig that's the same thing, but they're ounce ounce and a half. Mm. But if if I'm fishing thick grass or whatnot, I'll actually switch over just to a green pumpkin swim jig and work it like I do a regular jig. Yeah. It comes through grass so much better than any other jig. Yeah. I found a little bit heavier. I love the swim jig part of it too, but say that's if I'm like, say eight foot or shallower, but say I'm trying to touch on that 12 to 14 in the grass, you know how it can <laughs> get like, you're just waiting, you're waiting those half ounce and three quarter football heads. And that's when you asked me earlier and I was kind of like, no, it really don't matter. That's when line time matters to me. Mm -hmm. And that's whenever it comes through coming through that grass, because I feel like the position of that. And when you're popping it through there, that stuff just rolling off of that football head, like any, and it literally creates the separation through a lot of the stuff. So your hook can slither right through it and you're not getting that grass, but you know, see an, an Arky style head will come through grass pretty good with a yeah. vertical line tie. Uh, footballs will not come through grass very well from in my experience they catch on everything so y'all too different right there on that I, that's where i learned when the line tie because i uh i have not been able to fish a many grass mm -hmm. lakes gunnersville is one of them i've got to spend a good amount of time over there and that's when i figured out that in the deeper and you're trying to snatch through that stuff there's certain i forget which one what i want to be honest with you and tell you it was a strike king uh, and it may have been a hack, uh, hackney jig, but or one Joey board, but the football head and the line tie, it would come through the grass, uh, a lot better than what I was dealing with because I was wanting the swim jig, but it also may have been the type of matting that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Like, is there grass suspended there? How thick is the eel grass that's chopped up everywhere? So, I feel like it's in the everyday's bass fisherman. What do we do? We go out there and we fish the conditions, mm -hmm. we fish what's thrown at us. So, 
I feel like that has a lot to do with it also. It is the one playing field where we cannot control, uh, you know, the environment that we're in. We cannot control the conditions. You know, we choose whether or not to go or not to go based upon conditions, and that's totally up to you. I'm not going to ridicule you if you, you know, don't want to go because it's hot, don't want to go because it's cold, don't want to go because it's raining. And, you know, it's the conditions that you pick. Um, does tungsten make a different sound than lead? Yes, it does. It, it does make, make a different a, sound. It makes more of a tick than a thud. Your lead when it hits is more of a thud when it hits. Your tungsten is more of a yeah, a tick, more of a thud. Then it'll trigger a bite. I've I've noticed it switch over to a tungsten jig, and you can't get a bite, and all of a sudden you're putting them in the boat. Yeah. Don't get me wrong; you're paying ten dollars for them. Yeah, yeah, you are paying ten dollars for one. Whenever you want a bite, <laughs> sometimes I'd give them twenty for a bite. <laughs> As, I'm assuming you couple that with a jig facing tag in on your line. Yes, that would be what we would call a, and talk about in the grass, we would be talking about that as a vertical line tie. Mm-hmm. It'd be straight inside mm-hmm. with you when you're looking at that jig, which is most be just of like this Georgia jig that's laying around over here. Yeah. It'd be a, it'd be a vertical line tie, just like this one right here with this Georgia jig. It is a vertical line tie. Vertical line tie swim better. Uh, they come around cover a little bit, a lot better than uh, horizontal line tie jigs. Not saying you can't swim a horizontal line tie jig, but if you're really wanting to get that head drop with a jig and you're swimming one around, a vertical line tie is uh, by far the best way to go. Well, you fit, you fish, you fish the conditions you're given on that given day. Say we go to Gunnersville. Gun, all Gunnersville is is hydrilla, millfoil, eelgrass. And just, I mean, as thick as it can be, you tie on a horizontal line tie, you're going to fight it all day. Yeah. You're going to have to, you'll sit there and it'll, it'll bog down. You'll have to snap your rod to try and get it loose. You'll still pull in a ton of it. Um, put on a vertical line tie. It'll kind of split the grass mm-hmm. as it comes through. Uh, you're still, I'm not saying you're not still going to pull some with you. Snatch. Still, yeah, still got to snap, snap it when it, it, but you're not going to pull near as much as you would say as a horizontal line tie. That's again, that's why I like to throw a swim jig as an actual, like just a dragon jig mm-hmm. that I drag like an archie head in grass because I can bring that swim jig through that grass so much easier than I can any other head. That's why every now and again, you ask me to make you swim jigs with no eyes on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes he's like might me some swim jig but i don't want no eyes glued on them <laughs> okay um do you always throw a skirted jig or do you use other items on the hook well if it's not don't have some form of a skirt it's is it a jig you're pretty much you're pretty much throwing a a, a peg texas rig at that point with a weed guard yeah um i will actually if like the creepy crawler or the spider jig. It's still got the skirt, mm. but it's all plastic. I throw it a lot. Um, I actually will uh, throw a cross style, just a straight cross style on a, on a jig head. Uh, but then how much that. are you jig head fishing? Mm. How much then? But then what, what do you draw the line on whether or not you're jig head fishing or jig fishing? Or shaky head fishing, depending on what I'm catching. If I'm just catching spots and they're ke- they're just keying in on that smaller stuff, but mm-hmm. I still want to have a big stick in my hand, mm-hmm. then I'll jig head fish. But yeah, spots um, are real bad about it. Large mouth, not so much. Um, large mouth. The way I approach a large mouth is, I'm going to start big and go smaller. I'm not going to start small and go bigger like spots. Yeah. We got about five minutes left. Uh, any of you guys tried throwing a jig with a swinging hook, the six inch axle? Um, I mean, I want to answer it first. <coughs> Hell no. I don't like a swinging hook. On I, head. I don't want no swinging hook on that thing. That's a totally different. That's a totally different rod for me. That's a totally different setup. It's more of a wobble head for me. Yeah, that's and true. a wobble head is a completely different bite than a jig. It's a, it's it, it's almost like a when you're throwing something that has a swinging hook like that, like a wobble head. To me, and I'm not necessarily saying this is Bible or anything, but to me, I'm almost in a mindset of I'm kind of crankbait fishing with a creature bait mm-hmm. instead of a crankbait. 
that's just for me. Um, I'm sure it's a fantastic bait, but I, I, I ain't going to reach for one and really go for one. Um, all my action, I want this skirt here. I want this skirt to pulse. I want it to flare. And I want what's going on back here to do its thing, whatever it may be. Whether it has a ton of action, whether or not anything, you know, does it have action, does it not have action. I want this skirt to profile. I want it to be, a, like Casey said earlier, I want it to be a, a meal. I want it to look like a ribeye steak, not a filet mignon. <laughs> and uh, everything else after here on the back half of this thing is where it gets important on your day-to-day -day conditions. Um, we got people are uh, we're throwing out some, you know, the, the War Eagle you just finesse jigs and the, they, they're good jigs. They're expensive jigs. But uh, do you guys use scent? I'm on the fence about its effectiveness, but would – like y'all's opinion. I I said earlier in the show, I use uh, Spike It with uh, a mix. It's actually a concoction that I make. As my concoction. I use a big Spike It jar that has a combo of Spike It, JJ's Magic, WD-40, and it's uh, either chartreuse or methylate orange. And then I use uh, the uh, Crawfish Bang or the Crawfish Combo uh, spray sometime. That's just me. That's what I like to go with um, in terms of uh, scents and stuff. I think y'all hit on that a little bit earlier. I think Casey's more. I'm strictly JJ's. JJ's. I'm just stuck. With, I'm, don't get me wrong. In Spike, it's there. I'm, I'm with that too. Yeah. But yeah. I, I like, don't use much scent. I use the garlic scent. Mm -hmm. uh, Spike it. Um, a lot of our trailers nowadays, like we'll take these power baits, for example, they have the scent in them already. So if you just add more scent to them, sometimes I believe that there is a case where you will overpower the the thing where it goes used, in there and you're like, they're like, damn, what is that? I used to use when I, when I first started jig fish, I used to use that smelly jelly. Yeah. And stuff like that stuff stinks. And uh, you, you think, oh, man, I got bit on a jig with smelly jelly. That's the only way I can catch them. But then you stop using it and you're catching just as many fish on it. Talking about smelly jelly before we go on to the next question here with the last few minutes, we're going to hit, hit, hit the questions quick. Bait fuel. Have you, have you used it? Have I've you used it, it with I've a jig? <clears throat> you see a difference in it? I'm always fishing it. So I have a hard time seeing a difference in like, but I feel like those, Oh, they've only like we were talking about earlier. The they've on only got my legs. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. He's hanging on. He, he's got it in his pocket a little bit longer mm -hmm. just because it was on there. And, and it may just be, you know, my conscience telling me that. But I honestly feel like that there's an advantage there. And I'm not I wouldn't skimp on it by no means. No, as I start to say, using scent, they'll hang on to it a little bit mm -hmm. longer. Um, and every now and a whole then. little bit more on them. But um, I want to I do want to touch on one thing. Go ahead uh, with the, we got time you change or. Do you change colors as far as jigs go, your jig skirts, or do you change your trailer to match the color you're wanting to go with? Do you change your jig color? Unless it's just some off the wall, you're going from a green pumpkin to a black. I mean, you can't really do that with a trailer, but you're trying to mimic what you see as the hatch. Are you, are you changing your jig trailer or jig color, or are you changing your trailer color? I changed trailer color for me. I thought I was the host of the show. Sorry. I changed trailer color. I'm just messing with you, dude. Uh, I changed trailer color uh, or, or trailer size more than I do anything, especially if I see smaller crawfish, if I, if, if I see that they're chewing on end stars, whether it be <laughs> first, second, or third. You know, then I will, you know, if, if I know they're eating first or second end stars, 100% the creepy crawler is on the back of my jig because that's as small of a profile pretty much. And as thin of a profile as I can get. Um, that's just me personally. Um, I, color wise, you come claw in my boat, which you have, you've seen my boat you've been in my jig box. I got like five colors and I don't really deviate too terribly much from it. No matter where I go, I feel like I can catch fish on the five different colors. And then the, the, the combos of the creepy crawlers that I was talking about. I feel like I can get bit on those more times than not for me color. I know Casey, he's going to say uh, 
PB and J or die. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not. So, just, it, it's it's a ninety ten for me. I mean, don't get me what? wrong. I love like around here in the reservoirs. I'm gonna have green pumpkin or PB and J. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. But there will be those three random colors in there, and we didn't even get to touch on the bladed jig aspect of it. But we'll have to do that in another. That's time. a totally different category. That's a totally it different comes category. To stuff, but. The question that Farmer asked, going back to the question he asked, excuse me, I would love to change both of them if that's what it takes. But, of course, I will start with the easiest, kind of like fixing a car. You're going to check the fuse, or you're going to put a fuel pump in it first. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I'm going to swap the trailer, try it out for a minute. I get a little frustrated, a little bit impatient. Okay, let's, let's, let's change the whole game here, mm -hmm. you know, and see what we can come up with. Yeah. And if not, we surrender and throw the ball and chain, as you said earlier. <laughs> Silicone or living rubber? I'm going silicone. Me too. All day long. And I love the living rubber for very, very, very big largemouth in the Tennessee River and with keeping them in a 100% like room temperature. Don't worry about it melting in because it's kind of like the Z-Man stuff. Like yeah. it'll just it just goes down, and before you know it, you've got four other jigs wrapped up in it, and your twenty dollars is gone because you had one half ounce football jig or something that you had in your box, and the rubber just melts to nothing. But the flare that it puts off, like as if Farmer was talking about earlier with having that small chartreuse on there, those bigger largemouth, and if you're looking for those. The larger bite over there, I wouldn't put it past throwing it either. But me, I'm so consistent in throwing a jig. It's going to be silicone nine out of ten times. Yeah. Um, <sighs> silicone 90% of the year. Living rubber when the water's cold. I like when it. the water's cold, I want the living rubber because when the water's cold, silicone don't move much. Living rubber has this tendency to just kind of when it goes out there and the jig lands on the bottom and it just kind of does this little more mm -hmm. called a mop jig for and it just it's 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 like <laughs> it's like a it's a bunch of strands that are folded out with a <laughs> trailer in the middle of it. Um the mop jig stuff. I hate Z-Man stuff. Yeah, I don't really use much Z-Man stuff either. Do you when I first started I did I was like die hard not like hard but because of the chatterbait yeah i was on that wagon i mean caught me a couple six and seven pounders and they sold me really quick but i bought into their worms and into their crawls and i'm not hating on them by no means but you'll just waste so much money that i don't care if you have it in the most climate control place that there is mm -hmm. it's still gonna happen keep it in the bag yeah no, don't, I always do, don't, did. don't do my mistake that i didn't know you weren't supposed to put them around regular baits and a box i did and ruined every Ooh. every every worm that i had in that box them z-mans are nasty stuff mm -hmm. we're going to answer these last two questions we're going to get ready to sign off because it is a thursday night and we appreciate all you guys that have been watching hopefully y'all learned a little <laughs> bit um chris page is swim jig better or football jig on the bottom better rock football jig all day every day See, I hate football jigs. I just if I you're Arky them. or Arky, if you're in chunk rock, Arky and football head aren't going to get hung up as much because you're going back to the V of a swim or it's got a narrow nose. Yeah, the swim jig does. If you're dragging it through rock, you're going to get in them creases. You're going to fight it all day. If I'm pulling through grass and I'm throwing in wood, I'll throw an Arky or a swim jig or a swim jig head. Same thing. I just don't. I'm an Arky fan. Jig. I'm strictly ninety nine percent of the time. It's me Arky. too. Yeah, ninety nine percent of the time. I guess I'm a sucker for it, but it's got me. Last question: Any of y'all throwing hair? Oh, there's Mark Mosley, father-in-law. It's good people right there. There you go. He's a good one. Any of y'all throwing hair when it's really hey, cold? Hey, Grizz. Sorry. Oh, preacher's no, jig. Good. I throw the preacher's jig when it's cold. Yeah. You do. Mm -hmm. I don't. I pretty much. I look for mud lines when I throw a preacher's jig in the winter time. I you, look for that. You, I look for that clean water and that dirty water to hit yeah. right where them fish are sitting in that mud line. 
that's where you can catch some damn. You're gonna have to giants. explain real quick now. You're gonna have to explain real quick what a preacher's jig is. Preacher's jig is a hair jig, just a hair's jig, a hair jig. Yeah. That's all it is. Deer, yeah. deer well, tail hair. The only reason I said that's because I know someone's gonna be like, "Well, I didn't know what they do. I never heard of that before." So, <laughs> yeah, preacher's jig. <laughs> preacher's that ain't, jig. How's that different from bucktail? Um. Uh, well, it's same same thing. Uh, preacher jig have a, uh, some feather in it. Yeah. To every preacher's jig that I've ever seen that was called it's a they said, this is a preacher's jig. It's, it's a teardrop. A, it's a teardrop profile. Yes, to yes. The and preacher's it's, jig. And most of the preacher's jigs too that I've seen too, like a bucktail jig. You know, sometimes they'll be this long. Mm -hmm. They'll have a bigger. Every single preacher's jig I've ever pretty much seen is like about that. Long. Well, you you've got some preacher's jigs that are six inches long. It yeah. just depends on what. But a lot of those that I've seen that are that big, they have like flash <laughs> flashaboo in them. Flashaboo, they've got uh, the the red. Uh, Damn, we're gonna have to quit throwing stuff. Out. Yeah, I've got the red feather or whatnot. But my my go to preacher's jig is that just straight white with the red um, thread tie. Yeah, I got one upstairs. And I love those things for cold when it's cold, cold brutally cold. Yeah. When you're starting to see a shad a shad kill, yeah. I'll start pulling out the hair jig. Yeah. When I start seeing a shad kill, I have uh I throw a uh creepy crawler with that I actually have that are white ice. I keep them close to me. I still have a jig tied on. I will throw when I say shad kill, I'll throw that white ice creepy crawler skirt mm. on a lead head. I love oh, I the short all chartreuse one too. That time mm -hmm. of year in the winter, yeah. The, I know people look it at it like, oh, different. only a smallmouth bait because they see all the guys doing it. They will bite it in the winter. Yeah, they cannot stand it. It's prettier than them. Yeah, it's more dominant than they are because it is literally taking their eyes from. Them. Well, wasn't it KBD that won the uh, on the Tennessee River up there next to the uh, on Chickamauga with a hair jig off that uh, shell bed? And it was chartreuse, wasn't it? I don't know. It was a white one. I, I thought. I don't know. I can't remember. And it, all he and it was dead. It was, it was late. I mean, it was hot, and he was out there just ripping that thing off the bottom, and then letting them pendulum back to, and they were just choking it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to have to do a round two. Can't get it. You can't because we can't get all this in. There. Um, there's still a few other things <laughs> I knew going into this, we would not make it. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to happen, but it's getting late. We're running over like one comment right there said, you know, it's a good show and it's overtime and you're still going strong. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Um, Casey, I love you, brother. Appreciate you to death. You're good friend. You're good people. As you always say, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate y'all having me. And I just, there's one thing I do want to say before I uh, let y'all go that the only reason that all of us are sitting here is because of our Lord and Savior. And he's the only reason that I'm able to sit right here and every one of these fellas are able to sit here with me right now. And if you carry that with you, I believe you'll catch a fish on a jig in your near future. That's a quote That's to well live by. That's a quote to live by. Y'all have so, a good one. Um, I will. That's kind of hard to end on right there for sure. So, Farmer, appreciate you as always. And uh, keep the lights on for us, Farmer. Keep the lights on. <laughs> it's been hard to do. It's been hard to do lately. <laughs> farmer works for Emma Chloe EMC. It's been it's been difficult. I know lately. So, guys, listen. We appreciate you guys' viewership. We appreciate our two fellows over here in the Peanut Gallery, uh, Mr. Drew Patterson and Harold Cantrell. Wanted to sit in tonight. Anytime you guys want to come sit in and come watch it, we got plenty of chairs in this place. You can come in here and you can uh, do this thing live and in person. And it's really fun. The pre-show and the after show is always fun. And uh, we always, uh, we always uh, have a good, a good grand old time doing these things. I think nobody will argue that. So we appreciate you guys support. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday night with another edition of the live. Well, don't know where we're going with this, but you know, we're going to be doing it again as always. And, uh, again, thank you to Jennifer and Peyton with for her outdoor apparel and Charlie Adams with Adams renovations. We appreciate you guys support. If you want to get on and be a sponsor for this show and any of our other YouTube content, TikTok, Instagram content that we all got hit us up. We will, uh, we will tell you what we can do and uh, how to do it. We appreciate you guys' support on everything. 
share the hell out of it. We love you guys. We appreciate you. And we will see you guys next week. Good luck to all of you guys fishing the BFL. Be interesting to see what happens this weekend on that two day on the near. So uh, you guys be safe. Y'all have a good one. If you go out in the heat this weekend, hydrate. <laughs> and come see me for a sun shirt. I got plenty of them. So y'all take care. We'll see y'all later on the next episode. Good night, everybody. <laughs>